All right, church, good morning. It is a snowy Sunday morning. I got up this morning and realized that if we had been meeting in person, probably wouldn't have been able to make the drive today. So uh, I guess virtual works better in this particular circumstance, uh, even though it's not pleasant. We miss seeing you guys. We are in the Gospel of Mark, and we want to keep trucking ahead. We are in this in-between time between the birth of Jesus, we're in his early ministry, and we're headed toward... Uh, the season of Lent, where we are going to start heading towards the cross in a few weeks. And so what we're going to see as we go through the Gospel of Mark, just kind of jumping right into it, is that we're going to see that Jesus and his ministry begins to, um, with increasing frequency, run into the religious leaders of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees, and later the Sadducees. And uh, he's not going to sit well with them. And we want to ask ourselves as we go through, because we are religious people. If we are anybody in the story, we are almost by default the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Um, we're the ones who go to church every Sunday. We're the ones who sing the songs. We're the ones who read our Bibles. We're the ones who say our prayers. And so we want to ask, what is it about them that caused them to push Jesus away? And how can we avoid that in our lives? As the disciples wrestle with who Jesus is. We want to ask those same sorts of questions. Remember, Mark is asking us these uncomfortable questions. And so today we're going to begin in Mark 3. And just kind of like last week, I want to share um, three bigger stories with you. Um, actually, we're going to start in Mark 2, going into Mark 3, rather. Uh, share three bigger stories with you. And I'm not going to take time to read them today. I don't have time on the film to do that. But I want to encourage you to go home and spend some afternoon. I guess you're already home and spend some time this afternoon reading and wrestling with these texts. We're going to pick up where we left off last week in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 18. And remember, leading up to verse 18, we have this series of healing stories that ends with Jesus calling Matthew Levi to be a disciple. Matthew gets up and he leaves his life as a tax collector to follow Jesus. And as we left the story, Jesus was getting in trouble with the religious leaders. Um, Jesus is at Levi's house eating dinner with sinners and tax collectors. And uh, this theme that we see throughout Jesus' healing stories is coming into full focus where um, the holiness and the goodness and the beauty and the healing of the kingdom of God flows into the brokenness of the world. Whereas we generally assume that when we come up against something that is broken, that brokenness, that darkness, that impurity is the way that the scribes and the Pharisees would have looked at it, flows into what is clean and holy and good and beautiful and makes it dirty. Jesus reverses that uh, flow. He reverses the way we think about things. And so he's in trouble with the scribes and the Pharisees. He's defiling himself by hanging out with these people. But Jesus came, he says at the end, to tend as a doctor to sick people. He did not come to call the righteous, which is deeply ironic because there are no righteous people. There are only those who know they are sick and those who pretend or who are ignorant of the fact that they are not. And so from there, it goes to another story in verse 18 of Mark chapter 2 uh, about when we should fast. And uh, John's disciples and the Pharisees are actually uh, together on this topic of fasting. They were fasting on a regular basis as a part of their religious exercise. And some people come up to Jesus and say, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but yours don't? This is in verse 18 of Mark chapter 2. And so Jesus is going to go on and he's going to address this situation of fasting. And essentially he says that when the wedding feast is going on, when the bridegroom and uh, the bride have come, that is the time for celebration, the anticipation that fasting represents, the, the waiting for, the longing for that fasting represents. All of that is indicative of a time before the wedding feast starts. You're prepared, you're waiting, you're looking, you're longing, but now... The wedding feast has begun. The kingdom has arrived. Goodness of God's reign is breaking out, as you can see in these healing stories that Jesus has been telling. And now that anticipation, that longing, that fasting, as it were, is not appropriate like it was before. And in verse 21, he gives us uh, this enigmatic saying that is going to set at the heart of uh, what we're talking about today. 
He says, no one sews a piece of new, unshrunk cloth on old clothes. Otherwise, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and makes a worse tear. No one pours new wine into old leather wineskins. Otherwise, the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine would be lost, and the wineskins destroyed. But the new wine is for new wineskins. And I think as we go through these stories, one of the things that we're going to see is that what Jesus is saying here kind of comes to the fore. That Jesus is in the kingdom of God and in his ministry and ultimately in his death and his resurrection and his ascension. He's bringing to birth a new sort of thing. A new way of being human, a new way of being community. God is now in Jesus restoring the world, defeating the powers over the way the world is and bringing to bear the way the world should be. And Jesus says, one of the things that you're struggling with to those who are coming to talk to him, he says, one of the things that you're struggling with, one of the things that the disciples are going to struggle with, and one of the things that the the Pharisees and the scribes are going to struggle with, and one of the things that we will struggle with, is that when this newness comes, it's going to have to bring a new way of doing things. You can't just comfortably situate the new stuff, like a new piece of cloth patching an old pair of pants or new wine in an old wineskin. You can't just comfortably situate the new stuff inside of the old ways of doing things. It brings a whole new way of doing things that is disruptive, that is destructive, that wreaks havoc on the old way of doing things. And so just bear that in mind. We'll come back to that as we go on through. Starting in verse 23, we come to a different story, and this is a Sabbath story, and we're going to run into two Sabbath stories this morning. Jesus went through the wheat fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples made their way. They were picking heads of wheat, and the Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the Sabbath law? And of course, the Sabbath was that day, every seventh day, you were supposed to stop. And you're supposed to rest. And um, that wasn't a legalistic requirement. It wasn't God just, you know, back in the day coming out of Egypt saying, hmm, I think we need to follow some rules here. Let's just make up some I got an idea. Let's just stop on the seventh day. It's because I say so. But rather, in the, the original context, the Sabbath was a means of grace. The Sabbath was a blessing for the people. They had just come out of Egypt. They were slaves. They were forced to work to survive day by day by day. And if they didn't work hard enough, they were beaten. And so they are always on the go. And now they come into the wilderness and God says at the mountain of Sinai, he says, I'm going to give you a new way of doing life. You're going to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And so here's what I want you to do. On the seventh day, I want you to rest. I want you to stop. And so what is, was intended as a good thing by the time Jesus rolls around had, in many cases, by the scribes and the Pharisees, been kind of warped into this legalistic burden. And one of the things that they would talk about is how on the Sabbath, obviously, you should not harvest grain. But they interpreted that so strictly that the disciples walking through a field, grabbing a couple of heads of grain, rubbing them together in their hands, and then just eating them as a snack, they inter- per- <clears throat> excuse me, interpreted that as harvesting. And interpreting that as harvesting, they said that the Sabbath, or the the disciples rather, were breaking the Sabbath. And so they attacked Jesus. And Jesus comes down at the end. He tells a story about David, an unusual circumstance or a different circumstance, breaking the law. And then he says at the end in verse 27, the Sabbath was created for humans and humans weren't created for the Sabbath. This is why the human one is Lord even over the Sabbath. I was reading uh, for another project this week for homework. N.T. Wright was talking about the Sabbath, and he reminds us when he came to this text that the Sabbath always pointed towards something in the future. And what Mark claims, what Jesus claims here, is that that thing the Sabbath pointed toward was what Jesus was doing. And so he said, you would not put a sign up pointing toward London in downtown London. You do not need the sign pointing toward the reality that Jesus is bringing when Jesus brings the reality. So again, there's that theme of there's something new breaking in here, and that's going to change the way that we think about the old things. But this is going to come into tension. This is going to butt up against the way that the Pharisees do things. And so then we come to a third story. I'm just kind of getting these out on the table very quickly. 
We come to the third story, and Jesus returns to the synagogue, and it's still the Sabbath. And there was a man there in verse 1 of Mark chapter 3 with a withered hand. And the Pharisees wanted to bring charge against Jesus, and they were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And he said to the man with a withered hand, Jesus kind of sees what they're doing here. He says, step up where the people can see you. He kind of brings them in front of the Pharisees. Then he said to them, is it legal on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they said nothing, and looking around at them with anger, deeply grieved at their unyielding hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he did, and his hand was made healthy. And at that, the Pharisees got together with their supporters of, with the supporters of Herod to plan how to destroy Jesus. And so we have the scene set for this conflict that is coming as we head towards Lent. Jesus is entering into this period of contestation, of conflict, with the scribes and the Pharisees. But this morning I want to ask in the stories that we've looked at, why did they stand against Jesus? Why would anyone be opposed to what Jesus was doing? And I think that the heart of it, just for us to consider for a moment this morning, is in that uh, new piece of cloth on an old piece of clothing, that new wine in an old wineskin metaphor that Jesus gives us. And that's simply that the Pharisees, like all of us, had become accustomed to doing things the way they did things. We have this tendency, I think, to assume over time that the way we do things is the right way to do things. And of course, we don't do things because they're the wrong way of doing things. And if we do it this way and we're committed to doing what is right, then it must be the right way of doing things. We, we kind of fall into that thinking sometimes, don't we? Our songs are the right songs. Our order of worship is the right order of worship. Our way of doing things in this particular circumstance is the way of doing things. And when Jesus comes on the scene, he pushes the Pharisees and the scribes and the disciples and the people. Remember, in the story about fasting, it wasn't the scribes or the Pharisees who came to Jesus. It was somebody just observing. They asked... Let me turn my alarm off. I'm doing this early this morning. Um, they asked Jesus, why do the scribes and the Pharisees do this? And you do something different. Um, Jesus is going to push them outside of their comfort zone. Jesus is going to push them outside of what they know and what they think has always been the right way of living life with God. He's going to say that God is bringing to bear something new and if we're going to embrace this something new, that's going to require taking new forms. That's going to require getting a little bit uncomfortable. In the scribes and the Pharisees' case, it's not necessarily a religious expression that Jesus is asking them to change. He's asking them to accept, to embrace those that they had considered unclean, to accept that God loves those that they considered unclean, to accept that God is now working and walking and living among those that he considered unclean. And in doing so, they might have to confront the fact that they too are broken. It's going to require things like that. And sometimes, oftentimes, at various points in our life, if we are going to follow Jesus, we are going to have to get uncomfortable. And one way I was thinking about it this week, just to illustrate a different way, is we all know that at the heart of Jesus' way in the world is this notion of love. And we talk about how agape love, the word used for love in the New Testament, agape is the sort of love that puts the other person first. It's not an emotion as in, I like you. It's not a warm, affectionate feeling. It is, this, it is, a, it is a decision to put someone else first, to put their well-being first. But what I want you to consider this morning is, as nice and as fluffy and mushy as that can sound, as sentimental as that can sound, it's a hard thing. Because at the end of the day, it is impossible to love with the sort of love that Jesus is talking about without making yourself vulnerable. If you're not willing to become vulnerable to pour yourself out for the sake of somebody else, potentially opening yourself up to discomfort or to awkwardness or to some sort of hurt, then we can't love. It is impossible to put someone else first without being vulnerable ourselves. And so we've developed all of these ways of protecting ourselves, of, of um, being secure, of being 
comfortable, and I want you to focus on that word this morning, of being comfortable. And Jesus says, those are like an old pair of pants that have a hole in them, and you are going to be tempted to patch that old pair of pants with this new piece of cloth that I am offering, but I want you to know that that new piece of cloth will destroy that old pair of pants. You can't just put those two things together. And so I think about a lot of the wars that we have in church over things like Bible translations or the songs that we sing or what we wear to church or what we don't wear to church or how often we meet. And these are things that we haven't necessarily thought about in recent years at the Fernville Church of Christ, but we all know of congregations or have been to congregations where we have thought about all of these things and who should be allowed into worship and who shouldn't. Of course, we would never say that anyone is disallowed in worship, but we act differently sometimes. And and what we find often is that our comfort takes priority over following Jesus, that what we are accustomed to takes priority over following Jesus. I don't think we should sing those new songs because I like the old songs, or I don't think we should sing those old songs because I like the new songs. I think everybody should dress the way that I dress because obviously the way I dress is how you show your reverence to God. Obviously everyone should use the Bible that I have because that is the way of doing things. And it makes me uncomfortable when you get up and you read from some other translation, so on and so forth. We don't want to be bothered with the pressures of dealing with the poor coming into our congregations or the needy coming into our congregations or our gay or lesbian neighbors coming into our congregations or or people who are uh, different from us politically or even people who are different from us generationally because they bring different ideas they bring different ways of doing things some of them are problematic some of them are good by the way We should not be surprised that some of their ideas are problematic because many of our ideas are problematic as well. And Jesus steps into this entire mess and he says, you have these old ways of doing things. I want to give you a new way of doing things. And in that new way of doing things, there is life. You remember what he said to the Pharisees when he was healing the man with the withered hand. Is it uh, permissible to do good or evil, to give life or death on the Sabbath? Jesus was coming, he says again and again through this text, to bring life life. But if Jesus is going to bring life in our lives, we have to ask ourselves the hard questions. Do we want to follow Jesus more than we want to be comfortable? Do we want to follow Jesus more than we want to be secure? Do we want to follow Jesus more than we want to sit in our little bubbles and do things the way we want to do things? And hasn't this been a wonderful, painful exercise In just that, this last year, we've had to wrestle with how to best love our neighbors in a time where it would be very unsafe for us and for one another and for our neighbors, communities, to do things the way that we've always done things. This is part and parcel with following Jesus. So I want you to wrestle with that this week. Again, I'm not saying that you're doing good at it or bad at it. As a matter of fact, I think that you're doing a wonderful job. We're doing this on video this morning. Um, but we always want to take time to ask the hard questions. All right, I'm almost out of time, so let me pray for you. And you guys take a moment to remember who you are in your own household before we go back out into God's world. Father, we thank you for your love, for blessing us. We thank you for Jesus, and we pray that you would hold him at the center of our lives, that you would push aside all the things that keep us from him. Let us be Jesus' people. Now we come and we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you. Have a good week. Be safe. We'll see you as soon as we can.